Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Brian Motherway here at the International Energy Agency in Paris. We're delighted so many people can join us this afternoon or this morning or this evening, depending on where you are, uh, for what I think is going to be a really interesting and, of course, a very important discussion about the role of local energy communities in clean energy transitions. We at the IEA, as you know, talk about clean energy in very many ways. We look at all technologies, all fuels, all dimensions of the issues that are so important to us all around the world. And one we are putting more and more emphasis on is what we call people-centered clean energy transitions, where we think about this from a social dimension in terms of how people are involved in clean energy, how they're affected by clean energy policies, and of course, how can we make sure that the best policies the best programs are in place to help people improve their quality of life, improve their access to affordable, clean and secure energy. And of course, in ways that benefit the most people, leaves no one behind and brings the best benefits, including addressing climate change as rapidly as possible. And one growing dimension, of course, is this of this is local energy communities. We're going to hear from some really fascinating stories around the world where people are looking at how to involve local communities in clean energy, whether it's in terms of clean energy supply, how we use energy, how we work together, even how we own our energy systems, as well as how we manage them and use them. And I think we're going to learn some really valuable lessons from the excellent speakers that have kindly agreed to join us for this webinar so we can benefit from them, their experience, learn what has worked and what hasn't worked, uh, and maybe look for opportunities to extend the kind of models you're going to hear about in this webinar. And if you're joining us, we'd also very happily hear your questions. So if you want to put your questions in the Q&A box uh, on Zoom, if we have time, we'll certainly take as many of those as possible. So please do participate. I also want to say that a lot of our work here in the International Energy Agency on local energy communities, particularly in the context of renewable electricity, takes place within our program called 3DEN, which stands for Digital Demand Driven Electricity Networks. And therefore, we're very grateful in particular to the government of Italy and to the Minister and Ministry of Environment and Energy Security that support that work. Uh, but today we're going to really focus on the people dimensions, how are different people approaching how to involve people in energy, how to engage people in more active ways, how can pe people benefit from the clean energy revolutions we see happening all over, all over the world today, and how can we all learn from that uh, as we continue to expand this area of work. As I said, we've, re we've really excellent speakers who are doing this in many ways at a local and regional and international level, and I know we're going to learn a lot from them. So I'm not going to delay any further. I'm going to get straight into talking to our really great speakers. So first of all, thank you all for joining us. I'm looking forward to learning from you all uh, during the next uh, hour and a bit. Let's go first to Brazil, to Eduardo Avila. Eduardo is the executive director of Rebelu Solar, uh, which is the first photovoltaic local energy Energy community founded in a Brazilian favela with the aim of promoting the sustainable development of low-income communities through solar energy. So Eduardo, thank you for joining us. It's a fascinating story uh, that I know our audience are keen to hear. So maybe I can ask you to start by telling us a bit more about Revular Solar and just what, what makes this project special uh, in, in Brazil, please. Hello, Brian and everyone. Uh, good morning here from Rio, Brazil. It's an honor to be here with you. I'd like to thank also Mathieu and all the agency team that received as well while we were visiting there. And um, about Revolu Solar, we are talking from Rio here and uh, we are a nonprofit organization that really focuses on low-income population here, the people that are underserved uh, by the local utilities and by our, our current uh, electric, electric system. So we have a model that we have created here in partnership with local leaders from favelas. And now we are replicating to indigenous communities in the Amazon region and popular housing systems that really uh, uh, depends on the autonomy for the community. So we have this partnership with them that we really focus on educational uh, activities uh, so that the community can have the autonomy to keep it running. So. We have a professional uh, education program that, uh, that helps to, to form a technical, uh, a, 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 in technical aspects, electricians, solar installers, so they can do the installation, the maintenance and create new jobs. 
Uh, we also have educational program for the prosumers in the community. They, they learn how to read a bill with solar energy, how to reclaim their rights with solar, and really an educational program that, that also includes uh, children, all the community, and an important aspect is to form these leaderships in this community so they can do the, man the management of the systems themselves. Uh, we also have an economic sustainability model for these, uh, for these uh, systems. If we can go for the next image, uh, we're going to show, uh, this is one example of, uh, the, this was the first solar, uh, installate, solar install, ins installer, uh, women in Brazil, in favelas, uh, installing the first solar energy cooperative ever in a Brazilian favela that, uh, that relies on this new regulatory model that we have in Brazil for the shared generation. So the, in Europe and other parts of the world, the, the, the energy communities are traditional, but now we are starting that model here in Brazil. And we are starting from the low-income communities that really need the most this new, this solar revolution, as we call. The next image is going to show the people working on this cooperative. There are 80% women. Uh, all the, 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 the board of directors is is formed by black women from leaders from the community and uh, we are really partners with uh, with them giving this technical regulatory administrative support and connecting this grassroots movement uh, to municipal and national uh, level of government and now we are helping the government in Brazil to design a public policy uh, to bring these lessons learned in the field and to replicate it in a national level. So uh, to end my first talk here, the next slide is going to show how we are working uh, in the Amazon region with this new, same model of partnership, education, uh, sustainability in all aspects, including economic sustainability. So they pay a monthly fee to keep it, to keep the cooperative running, to, keep, to, to, to pay the operational costs Part of the savings they have in the utility bill is, pay, is paid as a monthly fee to cover the operational costs of the cooperative. We have also partnerships with technical schools and including public institutions of education uh, to bring this autonomy to the community. So next slide is going to show uh, this new project that we have in the Amazon. There were some solar systems installed there that were broken because they didn't have this, this uh, operation and maintenance and educational uh, importance. So in this new project, uh, we are getting there and we are cleaning, we are requalifying all the solar systems installed in the last few years there and giving this protagonism to the community. So I think next image is going just to show I'm going to invite you all to be part of the solar revolution, connect us in social media. And really thank you again, Brian, Mathieu, and all the agency team for the space and the partnership with us. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. And really uh, congratulations on what you've achieved. It's really a, a fantastic story with the emphasis on, as you said, grassroots involvement, but also the emphasis on the involvement of women and local people and for their benefit. Could I ask you to say a little bit about how, how this community came together? Was this a question of, of did, how much... How much work did it take, maybe on your part, on Revolu Solar's part, to build this 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 uh, project or this community? And tell us a bit about how this how this group formed in the first place, please. Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting story because the group was formed in the in the pre-Olympic Games period here in Rio, where where Babylonia, this pilot project, is a place that a lot of tourists, uh, people from abroad, come to see Rio. It's very close to the beach. And we have, and we got together here. So very nice, interesting groups. We had people from Europe that used to participate in uh, energy cooperatives in Europe. Uh, I was studying economics in the Federal University that was like 200 meters away from the community. And we had local leaders that were already working with electricity, reclaiming their rights with the utility here. 
and in some lunch and events, informal events in the community, we got to, to speak uh, to each other and to say, oh, one of the biggest problems here is the access to energy and this relation with the utility. And you have a lot of sun here. We have this model of energy cooperatives in Europe. I was studying energy transition and we got together uh, to, 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 to begin the idea of Revolut Solar. And our replication now, because we are working for several years in this pilot uh, community, uh, but now we are replicating. And how do we get to these new communities? Uh, we always depend, we always rely on strong institutions that are already in the community. We don't believe that we have to create uh, new institutions, new structures in the favela. We have to, to understand uh, where are the strong uh, points of the favela, we, of general communities. Now we are in the Amazon as well, but strong institutions there. And uh, we have a partnership with them, uh, giving some concepts and some technical support, but also rely, all, every, every time relying on these strong institutions that are already there. And so the, the, the group is already formed in these communities, you know, and we do a partnership with them, uh, giving these fundamentals and helping them to, go, to grow. Thanks, Eduardo. And again, looking forward to hearing more from you later. Congratulations on what you've achieved there in Revolu Solar. But let's go next now to South Thank Africa, you. where we're joined by Sharnay Blum, who is a researcher at the Stellenbosch University Center for Complex Systems in Transition. And Sharnay, thanks for joining us. And, and, and we'd love to hear what's going on in South Africa, but particularly, I know that you're involved in a really exciting project, uh, the Linodoc Smart Embedded Residential Microgrid which was ESCOM, the National Utilities first co-owned community smart grid project. So please tell us a bit about Linodoc and, and what has happened there, please. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Josh, and um, everyone from IEA. Um, yeah, so Linodoc is about 12 kilometers away from Stellenbosch. And Stellenbosch is probably about an hour's drive from Cape Town in South Africa. Um, it's uh, sitting in the Boerland in the wine region of the Western Cape. And uh, this eco village was established in the year 2000. And um, there's about 38 houses currently uh, built on this property. Um, but there's probably a little bit more households, um, more than one household staying in a house. Um, the case that I want to tell you about is a pilot project that ESCOM, which is, uh, like Brian also said, the National Utility of South Africa. Um, it was a pilot project that they ran and uh, that started in 2016. So, um, of course, this, uh, yeah, this uh, community is well known to be socioeconomically um, mixed. Uh, which means that the um, LSM is um, a very um, diverse um, sort of having low income uh, households living in the same property as um, very high income um, households. So um, part of this intentional community, I mean, they, like I said, they have diverse incomes but they're also um, ecological or environmentally aware and would like to put themselves uh, in the place where they've used a lot of energy efficient ways to build their houses using cop, using sandbags, using uh, all kinds of different and interesting uh, building methods. Um, and of course, um, the original goal why ESCOM decided to choose this community was because of the diverse income that the community represent and to test the possibilities of an energy trading platform in South Africa, because you have many places in South Africa, in Gauteng, in Western Cape, where you have uh, lower income communities right next to very rich kind of high income areas. And they were trying to see if there's a way that one could find an energy trading platform for this. So, of course, on a small scale, they tested this with um, 27 households. 
So it is a mini grid network that is still grid tight that they installed um, on the rooftops of the embedded solar PV um, on the rooftops of these 27 households originally. Um, currently, to only 26 is taking part. One uh, decided to not take part any longer. Um, what is quite interesting about this is that, of course, there's an array of embedded solar PV. There's six panels. They have uh, full capacity in the entire um, village of 41 kilowatt peak. And um, yeah, so I think that the 20, that's for the 26 households that's currently part of this. Now, of course, uh, this is in theory the capacity, but um, not all roofs are facing north and not all roofs are uh, uh, reaching the full capacity that they can. So, of course, um, yeah, this is what you get with solar, right? Um, and then, so they also connected to a free, uh, like a three phase, 100 kVA um, line that comes into this area. Um, it does not only serve the community from the eco village, there's also a school next to them and also Sustainability Institute, which is a part of Stellenbosch University, um, a um, sort of a master's uh, program that they run on that side. So they all share the same utility bill. And um, of course, this pilot is very interesting, but has also many like um, uh, challenges and um, also the very interesting key learning points. But um, yeah, I think that's the basics. <laughs> Thanks very much, Shana. And again, congratulations. It sounds a really interesting project. And thank you also for teaching me how to pronounce Lina Dock. So that's useful. Um, <laughs> is Lina Dock a typical community, do you think? Or, or would you say in some ways it was one that would be easier to build a project like this or harder? Or would you think in terms of replicability, it's fairly typical? So, I mean, like I said earlier, I think that Lina Dock represents a small area or like pockets in South Africa in the sense of these very typical uh, position that uh, some of our neighborhoods are in where you have very, very strong low income areas right next to very affluent areas. And I think that, of course, that is a benefit if you want to look at like an energy trading platform where one, uh, assuming that someone with a lower income has a lower in, uh, energy use, compared to someone from the other side. But I mean, some of the, I think, challenges that um, that ESCOM faced in this was, um, okay, one, I think one thing that is always a challenge when you do community projects is funding. So in this case, one would think that, okay, now we have ESCOM funding this, so it's the state utility, it's a monopoly, but of course they have their own challenges currently in the last couple of years. I mean, we've been having really bad load shedding, which is a power outages in the, in the country. Um, and I mean, so of course they run in their own, they had amazing goals to to test um, even electric cars connecting to these systems, and they have really they had really good um, ideas. But I think they ran in the in their own capacity. They also ran into financial trouble with that. And I think one other thing that was a kind of a challenge for us in I think in for them in in reaching this uh, goal was um, so in South Africa we have a national energy regulator called NERSA, which regulates the tariffs that you um that you charge for something so of course because it's the experimental site it was very hard for them to kind of find this um you know a sort of a tariff that could fit to this program and of course with any social technical um installation it's messy you know you have many challenges when it comes to user and technical design to you know bring this together and I mean line dock was was not any different I think that um, a lot of technical challenges were coming to the front uh, soon after and I mean I think it was a combination of one people not understanding how batteries or how the system work and then overworking uh, the solar when once um um, of course, you had the load shedding that could assist you in testing your solar, your solar, um, um, you know, system in the day. But anyway, and then of course we had in the um, 
something that you see sometimes with solar installations is that you have challenges when your appliances and your wiring is is kind of not used to this stable current you know and then they they sort of play up and i think a lot of people felt like wow now since i had solar things are not uh, positive for me anymore i feel like my, i have to get in electricians I have to pay call out fees for this so i mean the people i think felt a little bit uh maybe misunderstood in in the um in the intention that or the goal that was there and then also the installation process and the technical side of things that that obviously with like i said with social technical you always have these little challenges um and then yeah i think that um and then one last thing was obviously the net metering which is um something that yeah that um if you um, I mean, this is probably one, a, a very interesting learning point that we've learned is that one would think that you're now using a mixed uh, income group to actually regulate and see how you can do the, 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 the training of the trading of energy. But what's funny about this community is that they are obviously, they very environmentally friendly. So <laughs> They were they were not very big users, so of course that was another challenge. And then, of course, a good challenge and key learning point is that when you do use a community like this, maybe it's not good to use an eco village, right? Where people do composting and they use different ways of um, building their houses to 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 improve their energy efficiency levels. So I think that was um, probably the most important uh, learning point or. Yeah, key learning point that we we found in this entire um, pilot and case study. Thank you very much, Sharna. Very interesting learnings there that I think will, will certainly stimulate some discussion as we go forward. But let's turn now to Valerio Caviccio. Valerio, thanks for joining us. Valerio is a renewable energy community business developer at NLX. And NLX, I'm sure many of you will know, is a very large global business that, that works across cities, communities, businesses, households uh, in many parts of the world. And so, Valeria, maybe you could start by telling us in what ways you work with communities and indeed, why has NLX decided to work with communities? Well, um, um, thanks. Um, thanks, Brian, and thanks, Sharon and Eduardo, for your, sharing your experience. I would, I would like to start answering your questions, saying that we decided to in, uh, invest in energy communities because we have seen um, an increasing demand of people and uh, engaging and relating to the energy system in a different way. Um, energy communities. Uh, comes with a lot of benefits. We see a lot of people asking for accessing those benefits. And these benefits are uh, reduced energy bills, for instance, a long-term energy prices. So um, we are seeing that when a citizen or a company join an energy community, uh, can um, cover itself from the exposure to the market prices. And this is a great benefit for them. Uh, another benefit is, of course, the direct participation uh, in the energy market, as Sean uh, has mentioned in, in their, project, uh, in their uh, pilot project. And, of course, another benefit is the improvement in sustainability. So um, all these benefits uh, are moving uh, uh, and uh, are pushing uh, uh, and increasing the demand for accessing the energy communities. Uh, and that's why we, we are investing and developing energy community solution uh, for answering this, this demand. But um, for us, the, 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 the lesson is that we uh, can't run successfully an energy community um, globally. I mean, in, in every country, if you don't have some really fundamental ingredients on the table. And, and these ingredients are, first of all, uh, informed customers that are willing to participate. And as I mentioned, they are growing uh, more and more over time. So this is not anymore a problem. Um, the other ingredient is the technology. Uh, today, uh, PV plants are accessible and are uh, mature technology. Uh, but you also need resilient grids that can host this energy flow. Um, so, um, and the, the third 
probably the third ingredient you need is a regulatory framework that is stable and clear. So as uh, Sean just mentioned, there was some confusion in, uh, in the pilot project regarding the tariff. Um, so we see these three ingredients in phone customer um, technology, available technology and regulatory, clear regulatory framework as uh, necessary in order, to, in order to run successfully an energy community. So once we have these three ingredients in place in a country, we, um, we are confident that we can come and propose our commercial offer that if you, if you can move to the next slide, is, is composed of a wide range of, of solution that comes from the advisory uh, up to the um, electric mobility. So this is um, a really wide range of products in our portfolio that helps the, our customers and, and citizens to go through the energy transition uh, towards, of course, a uh, net zero uh, target. But um, in, in particular, what we are talking about today is, a, is energy community. So if you can focus on the bottom right part of our portfolio, you can see that we developed uh, distributed energy products uh, that are composed of PV system uh, and of course battery and energy storage systems, but also an energy community platform, which is crucial for us to uh, share with energy community members the way they are consuming, the way the, the, the power plant is producing and optimizing the match between consumption and production. So if you go to the next slide, the, the, the goal of NLX is, is really to optimize, optimize the uh, virtual self-consumption that happen uh, within an energy community. And we do this uh, by uh, doing a several uh, activities uh, such as targeting members, because uh, as you know, if you, um, if you take random customers, um, uh, you, you may not have a good match uh, when you see the aggregated profile of consumption. Uh, so the first, very first step is to um, com compose, let's say, this, this aggregation and uh, in, a, in a way that the, the total uh, consumption is uh, uh, optimized. And then on top of that, we provide a, other solutions according to the availabilities of the members. Because the good thing of energy community is that everyone come with their own availability. So if uh, um, you don't uh, want to invest money, you just want to consume energy and take the benefits, you can join the community and give your consumption uh, to the community. If you want to invest in a power plant, but you don't have consumption, you can. You can enter in our business model and invest and be the asset owner. If you don't, if you don't want to invest and you don't have consumption, but maybe you have a land, uh, you can rent this land and, and make it available for the community. So the, the real plus uh, for us um, in the energy community paradigm is this, is this flexibility um, towards the, uh, the, the members of the community. So if you want to optimize um, this, uh, this dynamics, so you can, uh, you can uh, access this wide range of products if you wish, and you can use a solution, our solutions such as EV charging or storage or even comfort management that is um, a, a software that op optimizes the heating, ventilation, and air condition. Um, so the message here is that it's um, we developed uh, a, a portfolio of solution that can uh, switch the um, needs and goals of each kind of members, um, and we are confident that when the three ingredients I mentioned, so informed customers, available and secure and resilient technology and grids, and are a clear and simple regulatory frameworks are in place, we can uh, really support any kind of energy community around the world for creating a more sustainable and equitable uh, future for the 
next generation to come. Thank you very much, Valeria. It's really interesting what you're doing. And I can see from what you're saying and then from that last slide that technology is really important here. Digital technology is really important. So could you say a word, first of all, about would this be possible without kind of some of the digital technologies that help manage such a system? But also when you're trying to engage a community of different types of people, does, does the role of, of kind of, let's say what I'd call advanced smart technology help things or does it, does it become a barrier for certain people that they, they need to be kind of tech savvy to get involved? Maybe you could just say a bit about that interface of people and technology, please. Yes. So the basic bricks of our solution is a PV and a web platform. So when you have a PV system and a web platform and every members can see they, their behavior and can see their consumption converting in a, um, in, in a revenue, um, you start changing your habits and, and get used to the, the patterns that may help maximizing your self-consumption. But on top of this, uh, we, we are not imagining a, a society when, where we, um, every day we pay attention on the production of the PV plant. So it may happen that I'm home and I want to start uh, uh, an, uh, some, some electrical devices according to this availability, but it may not. So uh, when you can't, there is the software, there is the algorithm that can help. So there may be another member of the uh, energy community that invested uh, a bit more on this kind of solution and is going to um, cover this extra production um, and, and is matching with his consumption, uh, this PV production. So I think that um, these are complementary approach on one side, the human uh, habits that I, I think um, can change over time. Uh, the more we, we develop um, regula regulatory frameworks that give a direct remuneration to citizen according to their effort to match the production, the renewable production, uh, we will see more and more changing habits. On the other side, we can't expect to uh, dramatically change our habits and our society. So we need to use AI, if you wish, or in general algorithms to program and change and be resilient and flexible to uh, the signals we have from these kind of PV plants. Thanks, Valeria. And just one other quick question uh, before we go to our next speaker, because in your opening remarks, you articulated very well a number of the reasons why communities benefit from this kind of approach, but maybe you could say a bit more about NLX's motivation in terms of what, why move in this, in this direction of community engagement as opposed to more conventional ways of engaging with your customers. Well, um, we see that uh, we are, as, as a company, as an L, we, we are moving from um, transmission and distribution, mainly a uh, company, uh, to an energy service company. So we see that the services related to energy are becoming more uh, crucial uh, over time because you, it's there that you really create the, the relation with the customers. You, you can, um, you know, when you, when you work in the business of, of energy, uh, for example, in the commodity, um, the, the message may be uh, only based on price or the last offer or, or the money you can save from a new commercial offer. But I think that services um, we can provide to our customer base can put us on another level of the conversation because energy uh, is not anymore um, a commodity uh, because, um, you know, we are starting understanding the externalities of energy. So if 10 years ago, you just turn on the light and, and use your appliances, uh, now you start thinking, okay, but what happens when I turn on the light? I got emissions somewhere else. I got an impact on the environment. So it depends on what, which kind of energy you are using. And it's, this is not anymore a commodity. Because uh, you know the definition of commodity is, is is something that is shiftable. You can use 
this is, or that is the same, but if you use gas fueled energy, it's different if you use PV power plant energy. And the, all the energy efficiency product we are providing are um, all aligned to this vision to, uh, let's say, support the customer through this path to uh, the net zero uh, targets. So I don't know if I answered your question. You answered it very well. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you. Let's go now to Adela Tesserova, uh, who is unit head in the Directorate General for Energy, DG Ener at the European Commission. Adela, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and we see the great work that you and your team are doing in the context of the European Commission's increasing focus on the role of communities in energy. And particularly in the last few years, we see a lot of focus on the role of communities uh, in energy initiatives across the European Union. And so maybe to, by way of start, you could tell us why the Commission has decided to prioritize communities in this way and what results you've seen so far. Thank you very much and uh, many thanks for the invitation to be here in this very interesting uh, seminar. Um, um, so in the European Union, uh, we have been very much uh, trying to put the consumer at the center of the energy market over the last 10 years at least. Um, as we see more and more decentralized renewables uh, coming, uh, coming online and hence uh, there is of course an opportunity for consumers to be directly involved in different forms. And now during the energy crisis, we have seen that renewables um, promise uh, being the, the more affordable type of energy. And we have seen that uh, consumers who had direct access to renewables were much better off during the energy crisis. Um, so um, community energy, different types of it, uh, are directly promoted by, by the European Union in our legislation, uh, but they are, of course, only one form how consumers can get directly involved. Yeah, uh, this is, um, for me, just transition or the kind of the people-centered transition is very much about involving individuals in the green energy transition. And of course, we have different types of individuals. We have people who invest in solar panels. They produce their own renewable electricity. Uh, then we have people who cannot do that uh, because they, uh, they don't have the finance. And hence, we are promoting um, concepts such as energy sharing, where people who don't have their own roof, uh, they can access renewables produced by someone else. And we also pr uh, promote the concepts of energy communities. An energy community is, is a legal entity which is created uh, with, the, with the objective uh, to, to share energy or maybe also to supply energy. Energy community can do different things. Yeah, it can also store energy, it can produce, store, supply or share uh, within its members. Um, and energy community in Europe, uh, uh, the concept that we have is, uh, is, is, um, is a legal entity which is non-profit, which has environmental and social objectives. And uh, here, I, when I was listening uh, to the presentation from Brazil, uh, for example, this is very much what we are also trying to do in Europe. Um, energy communities or energy sharing are a very good way how to involve those people who would never be able to access renewables. Yeah, it's people who are currently stuck on fossil fuel contracts, which are very expensive and they very often uh, receive social tariffs or uh, other kind of subsidies to be able to pay their energy bills. So for these people, it is a, as a very good opportunity to access cheaper electricity, but also it is a very good opportunity to build um, more inclusive societies to, to support local communities. Um, and there I would say um, this might be even a bigger benefit actually than the cheaper energy. That's what we've seen that this type of initiatives have a huge uh, impact on uh, on the social cohesion and community life. Uh, very often people learn new skills. Um, they gain more confidence to engage in other, um, other activities of their life. Um, so uh, beyond cheaper energy, we, we very much value the advantage of, of social inclusion and, and, and community building. And, um, and, and very often we actually see also in Europe this type of schemes in socially excluded areas. For example, um, sharing of energy within a social housing where uh, even social housing company installs solar panels and then the inhabitants who are all tenants and they will never be able to invest in renewables themselves um, uh, they, they can share energy in this way um, so yeah it's a, it's a, in terms of what we see in europe uh, in terms of energy communities we have about 10,000 of them across european union um, the um, the uptake is of course different 
different across different member states, also for for legal reasons. In some countries, it is still quite difficult to set up an energy community or start an energy sharing scheme. Um, in other countries, there is more of a tradition. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very interesting area. Also, social innovation, as you said, Brian, at the beginning, uh, uh, decentra or um, decarbonized energy is not only about technology; it's very much about people and how they see it and how they communicate with this type of technology. So social innovation is, is, a, is a very important area as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Adela. It's really interesting what you're doing. And just on that, that point about social cohesion, what I think is really interesting. Is there a sense then of, of how big do you think community energy will become? Is it, does it only suit certain types of communities or do you think in a decade's time, everybody will be in kind of community energy schemes? How, how important do you think the, a community approach will be in the clean energy transition for Europe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, as I said, uh, energy communities or community energy is only one way how, how uh, people can access renewables and how can they share access to renewables. Yeah. We have estimations that by 2050, um, just under 50% of um, European consumers uh, will be also prosumers. So I think it's 42% or something like that. Um, so it's a bit more <laughs> under 50%. So that's what we expect according to our models. Um, so that less than 50% of European consumers will be producing their own electricity, renewable electricity. So there is, of course, big scope for energy communities and energy sharing so that those people who cannot invest in solar panels themselves or access, uh, we have also schemes of wind energy, community wind energy. Yeah, so it doesn't have to be only solar. Um, so there is certainly scope also for efficiency purposes um, because solar panels also have carbon footprint, you know, and, and so if we can use more efficiently what we produce, so it's not only injected into the grid as an excess, but it is directly shared within a community uh, that also helps to reduce the need for installment of solar panels. Yeah, so uh, I, I don't have a, a number <laughs> to tell you, but certainly there is potential and uh, certainly in Europe there is a big interest due to the energy crisis where uh, all European consumers um, are now very, very much aware of their energy bills. That has not always been the case. Now everyone is very interested in the energy bills and hence we have a lot of interest in renewable energy and not everyone can invest themselves. So certainly these type of schemes have, uh, have a big potential. Thank you, Adela. And I think that resonates with what we heard from Valeria about people thinking more about how they use energy, but also where their energy comes from, which clearly is very central to the community's model. So thank you for that. Let's go now to Rina Suri. Rina, thank you for joining us. Um, and I know it's later in the evening there, so we appreciate you, you joining us. Uh, Rina is the Executive Director of India Smart Grid Forum. Uh, Rina and the organization, the Smart Grid Forum, are, are really leaders uh, internationally looking at questions around energy transition, smart cities, electric mobility, particularly with some very innovative work in India. So Rina, uh, we've been hearing different perspectives in, in, from different parts of the world, but I know you've had quite a lot of hands-on experience about involving local communities in energy in India. So maybe you could tell us a bit about that work and how you've seen it evolve over the last few years. Thank you, Brian, and uh, for having me here as part of this important uh, initiative. And apologies uh, for joining a bit delayed because of the weather change that we are experiencing in India. Uh, it's um, like, you know, it's summertime, but we are getting uh, very good rains and it's nice and cloudy here. So we are we're not complaining, but uh, yeah, it's a change here. And uh, we are dreading, uh, you know, how the summer is going to be uh, going forward. Uh, but um, uh, thank you so much once again, and I would like to uh, say a few words about uh, our forum, uh, which you've already uh, said a couple of things. Uh, um, since its inception uh, in 2011, India Smart Grid Forum, uh, we've been working on accelerating development uh, of smart grid technologies, uh, bringing together all the different stakeholders, uh, uh, including government, um, uh, electric utilities, policymakers, uh, 
energy regulatory commission people that, uh, and uh, and as well as uh, you know bringing the communities and consumers together so we've been in emphasizing uh, that uh, with the transformation of the past sector of systems towards the uh, decentralized model uh, consumers uh, will play a key role uh, going forward and are playing a key role and uh, they need uh, to uh, you know to take an active role and uh, lead the way when it comes to the energy transition uh, by making lifestyle changes by investments and uh, saving energy, cutting down on bills and reducing uh, the environmental uh, uh, footprints. So, um, like, you know, India uh, experiences, uh, yeah, yeah, like, you know, from uh, the developed countries versus India, we still are uh, trying to reach out to all parts of India in terms of providing the energy access. And um, uh, especially in the areas where, uh, you know, the energy uh, has still not reached, uh, the uh, electric lines are uh, still not there. The community plays a big role uh, in, uh, you know, providing access to basic energy needs. And um, uh, the concept of uh, energy communities, uh, you know, from the experience uh, in India has been relatively new and um, it has gained significant trans, uh, you know, traction uh, in the recent uh, years initially. Uh, energy communities were playing uh, primarily focusing on improving energy access as i said you know in the areas where we were still trying to reach out uh, in the rural areas uh, by promoting uh, the distributed energy generation and storage but over time we have seen that uh, you know the scope of energy communities has expanded it has started to include uh, urban areas as well <clears throat> And today, energy communities in India are focusing on promoting renewable energy generation, demand side management, uh, uh, energy conservation measures to reduce carbon emissions and combat the energy, the climate change that we are experiencing. So one of the notable trends I would like to highlight, uh, you know, the evolution of energy communities in India that we've been working and with from experience is that the, in, the increasing use of digital uh, technologies, uh, uh, you know, that uh, uh, to manage the energy systems uh, that they have supported. So for, for example, many energy communities are uh, using smart grid technology, IoT devices and data analytics to optimize the energy consumption and improve the grid stability. So overall, uh, the evolution of energy communities in India has been characterized by, uh, you know, growing emphasis on uh, suitable uh, sustainability, innovation, and community participation. And as these communities continue to mature and evolve, they have the potential to play a significant, a significant role in shaping the uh, India's energy landscape. And how we have been working uh, and some of the initi you know, initiatives uh, which I would like to highlight from India's Smart Grid uh, Forum's uh, experience and the projects that we have been working with these communities. Uh, to start with, um, uh, uh, we have done three uh, uh, like you know projects bringing the local communities together uh, for peer-to-peer -peer trading of solar energy and which is a promising approach for local energy communities to op optimize uh, the use of renewable energy resources and uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading model um, uh, households businesses and other com uh, energy consumers with solar pv can uh, sl access electricity they ge they generate to uh, their uh, like you know and sell to their neighbors or other buyers in the same community and this approach can help, uh, uh, you know, to promote uh, local self-sufficiency, reduce uh, uh, transmission losses, and also support the adoption of renewable energy technologies and uh, the uh, uptake of renewables, which India has, a, you know, as per in, uh, the, the targets that we have set. So uh, this, uh, uh, you know, with this background, uh, ISGF, along with our uh, partner uh, for uh, technology pa pa partner for blockchain, we uh, together uh, have implemented three pilot uh, uh, projects uh, on peer-to-peer -peer trading of the rooftop solar in three states in India, one in Uttar Pradesh, Delhi, and West or bringing uh, you know different uh, uh, local uh, communities and consumers together to trade have uh, uh, you know tra trade between more uh, under the uh, regulatory stand box to sell the excess solar energy to their neighbors and peers so the consumers were able to set us uh, you know a price higher than the net metering tariff for residential customers and uh, was uh, lower which was lower than the residential tariff that the utility charges to the consumer for consumption of the electricity so thereby like you know ensuring a profitability for both buyer and seller 
So it, it has also helped the uh, customers who want bu to buy green energy, uh, green power by allowing them to purchase energy from a rooftop solar through peer-to-peer -peer trading. So based on uh, the uh, recommendations from these pilots uh, uh, that uh, we have uh, implemented uh, uh, from uh, like, you know, in, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, I would like to highlight uh, that uh, the regulator has already issued uh, uh, scaling up of this and bringing more uh, uh, consumers together to benefit from this scheme. So where uh, we see that energy, uh, you know, communities will play a key role in uh, taking, uh, uh, you know, uh, things forward. And recently, uh, uh, guidelines have been released for peer-to-peer -peer solar energy transactions uh, through blockchain-based uh, platform by the regulator in Uttar Pradesh, which is a groundbreaking regulation, which is expected to open up a new era of local energy communities, transacting clean energy amongst their peers, and this will be an important uh, step towards net zero power sector uh, in India. Uh, overall, uh, I would say that, you know, peer-to-peer -peer trading has the potential to empower the local uh, communities and uh, promote the adoption of renewable energy technologies. However, there are still some regulatory and uh, technical challenges uh, that need to be addressed to enable its widespread adoption in India, where uh, we are advocating and consulting, bringing all different uh, stakeholders and the communities together. And um, uh, we're looking forward to, um, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, adoption of this in a larger uh, part of India. Another, uh, one more project I'm, uh, that ISGF has uh, undertaken is uh, a pilot on implementation of time of use tariff, uh, again in the state of Uttar Pradesh, and which is one of the largest uh, uh, states in India. Um, and this pilot uh, is uh, being implemented under, again, a regulatory sandbox approach in which the regulator would accord, uh, has accorded permission to conduct the time of use uh, scheme. In India, we have, many states have time of day tariff, but uh, in terms of time of uh, use, uh, where, uh, you know, we set a price uh, on, on different, uh, uh, at different hour in the day to, for a consumer to benefit from the uh, search, uh, from the ben uh, from the uh, uh, like you know the um, extra benefit that is uh, done to shift the energy from peak load uh, to a non peak hour so again uh, this kind of an uh, uh, scheme will uh, was only possible by uh, like bringing the communities together uh, the customers uh, and uh, giving them the uh, understanding about the project we have about 50 residential industrial commercial <coughs> consumers on board with the low <coughs> total lo load of uh, sorry one second load of about 50 megawatt and um, uh, they they are uh, in shifting their energy loads from one time of the hour to a non peak hour and getting be benefited from that so uh, this is a time of use uh, scheme is a real time price signal uh, uh, that that uh, we are sending with uh, you know on their mobiles and requesting them to shift the load so this by with this pilot, we are estimating that uh, you know the uh, uh, we, we will have the discounts have a better understanding of how much load uh, shifting can be achieved uh, uh, by this kind of time of use uh, introduction of time of use tariff scheme reduction in their power purchase cost and uh, the difference uh, in the revenue that they will be seeking. So. One of the examples is that, you know, with the, um, like, you know, months we have experimented with this time of use tariff, we have seen that uh, some of our high-end consumers, they have been able to reduce their energy consumption to as, as much as 30 lakh Indian rupees, and which is a significant amount uh, for industry to reduce on. So the, going forward, when we are looking forward to a larger scale uh, implementation of uh, this kind of a scheme, which will be really benefited to not, not only consumer, but to manage the duck curve that we are facing uh, by, by, for the utilities. This will uh, help, uh, you know, with bringing uh, uh, introduction of uh, this through the communities together and bringing all the customers, uh, you know, uh, together uh, and uh, taking things forward. So the, these are some of the initiatives I wanted to highlight and the many more, uh, but I hand uh, the stage over to you, Brian, and I'll be happy to share more uh, experiences that we've had in uh, bringing the energy communities together to take uh, new technology initiatives forward and supporting the transition that India is looking for.
Thank you very much, Rina. It's, it's great to hear what you're achieving and congratulations. And also congratulations on some rain at last. I know it's been hot there, so it's, it's good to hear. Um, and, but let me start with where you left off. We're talking about scalability and, and growth. So first of all, what you've achieved is impressive. And, and you made it clear that, you know, it's profitable for the buyers, profitable for the sellers, there are community benefits, but also it's taken a lot of work on your part. You've had to break down regulatory barriers. You've had, there's been what I can describe as a lot of transaction costs. So do they disappear with scale? Uh, how, how can you scale up? Based, or will it always be, let me put it this way, will it always be more work to take a community approach or can it be scaled up uh, in, in, you know, in a broader way? So um, like, you know, Ma, from the experience that we have had uh, uh, from the two projects that I mentioned, one, uh, since it's a, it's a, a regular, like, you know, it's a, uh, our uh, power sector is a totally the one by the regulators. And uh, so the very first approach was to get the regulator on board and get his uh, buy-in on uh, uh, getting a go-ahead uh, to the utility for scaling it up and, uh, you know, involving the utility and uh, customers uh, uh, together to be able to, you know, have their buy-in uh, to make them understand uh, the benefits and uh, be, you know, help have them on board to be able to take uh, uh, it to another level. And in India, you know, the numbers that we are talking about, like in, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, the, the consumer uh, uh, are like, you know, two third of the uh, 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 total America, uh, uh, population of America. So that's, that's the kind of population we are talking about. So when we talk about scaling it up, we talking like a, a you know, billion or a very, very huge number. And uh, definitely, uh, you know, energy communities uh, will, uh, are going to play a very significant role. Uh, uh, we, we need to just find the right uh, touch points. We need to just find the right uh, places to connect and, uh, you know, ap apprise them about uh, uh, the, the, the <clears throat> benefits it's going to bring to the whole community to be able to help them uh, take this forward. And are there limits on growth, Rina? And uh, could this become the future of energy in India, or will it always be for certain communities that have certain, let's say, social characteristics or even technical characteristics, or how, how big can this get, do you think? So uh, definitely, like, you know, it has limitations in terms of, um, uh, like, you know, uh, one for, I'll talk about from the utilities perspective. You know, India, uh, the utilities are struggling to even... Um, meet their ends uh, in terms of uh, their expenses, the, their billing is not accurate, you know, as per uh, the, the bills are not uh, uh, paid as per uh, uh, a timely, in a timely manner, and uh, the huge debts that they are struggling with. But uh, you know, the very first uh, uh, technology idea, they, uh, uh, like, you know, getting their buy-in is the, the toughest uh, one because uh, uh, everything, uh, like, you know, in any kind of uh, change in the process, they relate to uh, reduced uh, billing. So uh, having them on board was, uh, like, you know, with our experience, we have seen that was the biggest challenge uh, because of the challenges they've been facing. But yes, uh, from the consumer point of view, uh, the high-end customers who are uh, facing, like, you know, having uh, huge energy uh, bills, getting them on board was the easiest. But then again, they are the highest uh, revenue earners for the utility. So any reduction in their usage was uh, ultimately, uh, you know, uh, uh, reducing the uh, uh, revenue for the utility. So we have to keep a balance. But, uh, you know, uh, from renewable energy integration point of view, when uh, India has set such a huge target, of 500 gigawatt coming into uh, play and uh, anyways consumer will be empowered to use their own energy so uh, uh, we have to look at all these different business models uh, in, involving the uh, uh, energy communities and utilities together so that you know they they with the uptake of renewables the, the there's a win-win for both consumers and uh, uh, like you know electric utilities both thank you very much rena so colleagues, uh, again, anybody joining us, uh, free to pop some questions in the Q&A of the Zoom, and we're getting some quite interesting questions, which I, I'll, I'll, I'll put a few of them now to our excellent panelists who've been, who've been uh, really giving us some interesting food for thought. And one question that's come in in a couple of different forms is around building trust in communities. And it seems all of you have interesting dimensions to this because it's different kind of engagement. So I might actually involve you all in various ways in this question of trust. Maybe Eduardo, I'll start with you about 
you have a very local model. So maybe you could say a bit about how, how you build that trust, let's say, between, especially, you know, in the sense of outsiders versus insiders. And a related question that's come in is, how do you build up a model that will sustain beyond your direct involvement? Or is this something that will always need hands-on involvement? Or is it something that can basically sustain itself ultimately? Thank you for the question, Brian. Uh... I understand that uh, social projects in general that target low-income communities, uh, most of them face the problem of being um, implemented in a top-down model. And this creates a, a feeling of, uh, of, not, of these communities not trusting uh, projects that come outside, especially in Brazil. I'm talking about Brazil. I have this experience here. So it's very important to, to build. I, I, I saw that one question talked about participation methods, uh, participatory methods, not only giving the information in one direction, but also promoting the participation of the communities in the designing, planning uh, of, of the project. So I think this is the most uh, fundamental aspect to build this trust. Uh, to involve the beneficiaries in the designing of the program. And this can be scaled up. Uh, we have some examples in the world of a big participatory uh, <clears throat> uh, moments, a big participatory listening to, to, to the communities. Uh, in Brazil is one very good reference in other fields, not energy. Uh, we are lacking that on energy designing programs, but in health, in education, we have like regional uh, forums to, to, to hear uh, the demands of the population and all, also federal uh, 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 places for, for them to, 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 to have their voices heard. So this is one aspect that has to come together with education, I think. So they can have the, the concepts and the tools that, in, that enables them to, to, to participate. And yeah, this can be scaled up. We are in that process. There is also one question that was directed to me, uh, suggesting us to, to produce or asking if we have a guidebook to help uh, this development of energy communities in a respectful approach. This is very important. And we are in the process of producing that guidebook. So uh, this question came in the right way. So we are producing that guidebook with the step-by-step -step on how to hear the community, how to involve them. And because we understand that this involvement is part of the, the success method that <clears throat> enables this community after the project is implemented to do the maintenance, to do the, 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 the management of the systems, a part of that maintenance and management. We also understand that other parts of other complex aspects of the maintenance and management has to be done, have to be done by the utilities. Uh, we understand that utilities have an important role in this new economic model, uh, but they have to shift their business model. They have to shift their, their approach to local communities but we understand them and that them and a local municipality government have an important role in promote, promoting this uh, fair energy transition. Thank you, Eduardo. And you said earlier on that you're now working with the Brazilian government to put policies in place to support these kind of approaches. So what, are, what would be the key elements of such policies be? What, what can national government do to enable these models? Great. Uh, yeah, we are in the beginning of this government, so we are in the beginning of the conversation, but we also we already have some uh, some ways to go. Uh, we are planning to integrate a distributed solar energy in a social way to the solar to, to the, the the popular housing system uh, program that we have in Brazil. It's called My Home, My Life, uh, Minha Casa, Minha Vida uh, program. And uh, we have 2 million new homes being built for the next three years uh, for low-income people. So this will be integrated with solar. Uh, we also have a big problem in the Amazon region. Uh, more, more than 1 million people without access to electricity. 
and we have a specific line of the program there uh, that also answers to another question that came here if these energy communities uh, could be integrated with battery. So yeah, for sure, uh, the integration of solar energy with battery is very important for these areas which don't have access to the grid, with the, which is in the Amazon region, and has to do some different mechanisms to 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 adapt to this uh, to the culture and the territory of the Amazon. But also, batteries can be included in uh, in 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 places that have access to the grid. Because we have a very big problem here, especially in low-income communities like favela in Brazil, that the, the number of outages, the, the blackouts of energy, interruption of, of, of supply. So the batteries can be used as a backup source uh, to keep the stability. Uh, and also, this also answers another question, which is what are the, 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 the characteristics of successful energy communities? I believe that engagement of the population, lower costs, jobs and income created, created the maintenance being made, and the quality of the energy access to stop, to, to minimize these power outages. Thank you, Eduardo. It's very comprehensive, very interesting. Adela, if I could turn to you on this question of trust, because, you know, Rina was talking about the scale of India in a state like Uttar Pradesh, the scale, and you have similar scale issues in Europe. So when we talk about, when we hear from Eduardo about local community involvement and local connectivities bottom up, that's difficult to do at your scale and from Brussels. So how do you see the respective role, let's say, of what the commission can do versus national government versus local actors? How, how does Brussels stimulate these actions at a community level across the union? Um, thank you. I, I would just first like to stress that um, um, the objectives of the European Commission is to have high share of renewables um, in, 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 in the energy mix. Yeah, we are helping member states with that. We have objectives at national level. Then how this is achieved, of course, is up to member states and we are favoring diversity. So I'm not saying that all this uh, uh, renewable electricity has to come from um, energy communities. Uh, they have a very important role to play. Uh, but of course, we have also centralized investments, big investments, and then we have decentralized investments. So uh, we are favoring variety uh, and uh, energy communities are one of the ways how to engage consumers, citizens, and it's a very, very good way. Uh, but there are others, of course. Um, and so the role of, of the European Commission is to provide an enabling uh, legislative framework. So to make sure that uh, these type of initiatives are possible, that they are not undue restrictions and barriers for this type of initiative. So um, at the legislation at EU level is, is ensuring that, yeah, uh, enabling framework, removing barriers. Um, we have also been uh, doing some concrete work on what are the barriers that energy communities currently still face in Europe. And then we work closely with member states to help remove these barriers. Uh, so our role is mainly the legislative. Uh, also, in some cases, we are helping with seed finance uh, to help this uh, type of projects uh, to come into life. Thank you, Adela. That's very interesting. Sharnay, if I could ask you about this question of trust as well, because I think it's quite interesting in your case, a local community that has kind of unique characteristics being an eco community, but also, as you said, quite a range of types of, of people and types of building but also the role of, of ESCOM, the utility. And, and like in every country, some people like their utility, some people not so much. So maybe you could say a bit about that question of trust, how trust was built up among all of the actors in Line and Dock and how it's maintained over time as part of this energy community. Yes, thank you for asking that question, Brian. I think that in uh, the Line Dock case study, it was quite an interesting, experience to see how the um, ESCOM representatives uh, actually engaged with the community. And I think that it was, um, yeah, they used um, homeowner association meetings that was dedicated completely to the um, discussions around implementation and um, where different members had different questions and all of this. Um, I think that some of the things that I found was kind of a highlight in, in these moments um, was 
especially in the beginning, I think that the intention was very pure from the ESCOM side to communicate well, to actually engage with the community, to hear the um, contribution in this uh, space. And I think later on when budget uh, issues came in, I think it became a little bit more tricky to deal with these community meetings because now people are very difficult and uh, rightfully so, um, you know, they, there was a contract signed between the two parties or the, the community members and then, of course, ESCOM and then, of course, uh, they couldn't keep their side of the deal later on. And um, I think this caused a lot of, um, rightfully so, uh, conflict in, in a way. And I think um, for me, that was quite an interesting time to be part of these meetings because just to also see, you know, how I think a, a national frustration for us is the way ISCOM has been uh, treating sort of people in the country. And uh, of course, it's a state entity, so it's way more complex than, than just making that statement. But I think that, uh, yeah, there was definitely an intention and uh, in the beginning, definitely a uh, engagement with the, the community. And like I said, uh, very specific uh, issues were raised and were definitely dealt with in a, in a professional way, I think, in, in, uh, giving the community um, their voice. Um, with regards to bottom-up, top-down approach, I mean, for me, it's more than just having meetings. It's also whilst it, installation happened, I think there was maybe uh, a bit of a lack of um, listening to maybe the the level of um, technical expertise from the users. Uh, which is a typical socio-technical um, thing that you find uh, where um, I think some of the community members were just literally not uh, educated enough or, or known enough about the system to actually uh, use it the way they could. And I think in that way, I felt like there was quite a lack in um, proper communication, proper training maybe, um, on that level. And um, yeah, I think that is uh, just a, a snippet in the experience. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you, Shana. And Valeria, we're talking about utilities and how utilities are perceived. So in a case like an L and an LX, is it different when you try and build a community com project from a, from a utility perspective? Or are there, are they, does that make it easier or harder, do you think? Well, um, I think that um, it's it's useful in in a way uh, that you can um, run some analysis, uh, as I mentioned, on the uh, correlation of consumption provides of your customer base. So um, you can propose to come in, inside an energy community to a set of um, members that is um, in an optimized way. So they that can join in together with their own uh, features and, and uh, um, you know, the, the, their own way of consuming energy. They can really match uh, and um, cover the production of the PV. Um, so in this sense, is is uh, is a pro to fr from the our my perspective at least to um, uh, to run a community within a, a utility. On on the other way around is that um, you know uh, I, I'm probably is the same balance that Rina was mentioning uh, uh, regarding utilities and uh, the revenue flows between uh, the distribution, the utility, the energy service companies. So uh, to me, um, if you run successfully an energy community, you have to keep this balance, uh, energy balance, but also financial balance uh, and, and um, distribute the value in a proper way between all the members. So uh, it may happen sometimes that the utility company is, is, is not happy about the behavior of the, of the energy community uh, or the distributor and so on. So um, you really need to set the business model 
according to the regulation and according to the expectation of every stakeholder from the household uh, in, a, in a poverty uh, maybe situation up to the, the biggest company. Uh, and uh, you really have to be clear uh, and set the expectation of what would be the, the, the benefits for all of them. Uh, I've seen a lot of questions uh, regarding what means uh, uh, run a successful, uh, su run successfully energy community. And, and to me is really to, um, to create this equilibrium uh, within all the stakeholders uh, involved. Yes, thank you very much, Valerio. And Rina, I might come back to you because we're touching there on the role of technology and particularly uh, digital technology. And you talked about the role of blockchain, which obviously offers a lot of security in the transactions, but I guess some people perceive it in different ways. So how, how do you build trust around the role of digital technology and particularly blockchain in, in a community project? Yeah, so um, like, you know, when we were implementing uh, the pro blockchain project uh, in uh, these uh, different uh, states that uh, we have worked on. So uh, definitely like, you know, we, we had to uh, build a full uh, consumer awareness or a community awareness program around before we could uh, connect and get the trust for uh, them to join us uh, for this project. So uh, uh, with this uh, holistic pro, you know, consumer awareness program that we had uh, put together, we uh, started with the uh, uh, initial survey, connecting uh, with the, each of the uh, you know, community uh, participants and uh, identifying uh, you know, different them or in categorizing them in different uh, uh, portfolios like, uh, you know, like on, on their consumption type, on the age group, on the salary type, etc., and oh, and then based on that, and uh, then uh, identifying the right uh, touch points uh, where we can connect with them, how to communicate, what is the most uh, com uh, effective method of communicating with them. So uh, identifying the right uh, communication strategy was the next step that we did, and we we did uh, multiple uh, 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 like you know uh, networking events uh, to have uh, like you know the buy-in. Uh, have the right uh, uh, like uh, point like uh, you know we have residential uh, 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 working groups we have industrial uh, community uh, uh, networks that we connected with uh, to get them on board to have uh, them join uh, because you know they they're going to play a critical role uh, uh, they you know in adoption of uh, the technology or particularly blockchain which is absolutely a new buzzword uh, for uh, uh, you know not only people who are in the power sector but for a consumer and uh, then uh, this involved uh, their uh, in, you know required their involvement on almost on a daily basis initially you know to set the price uh, and uh, for them to uh, 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 like you know at what price they want to sell and the uh, the consumer coming uh, on the platform uh, uh, bidding for uh, you know the amount they want to buy it uh, and who do they want to buy it so there was a huge involvement uh, that was required uh, from the community or the consumer. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we had to do a, a very uh, uh, holistic, uh, uh, detailed approach to get them on board, get them under to understand uh, uh, what all it takes and uh, why they should participate, what kind of benefits they're going to get. So, um, uh, like, you know, uh, otherwise this would not have been possible. Another example, when uh, India was uh, initiating the smart uh, 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 like, you know, uh, the smart metering program, I uh, just um, diverting from the blockchain uh, 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 rollout, but uh, e even when we were uh, rolling out the smart uh, metering, there was a lot of resistance. And uh, at the pilot stage itself, we had uh, uh, incorporated this uh, similar, pro you know, program to get the buy-in, get the people on board. Otherwise, there were huge resistance to, uh, and, uh, you know, myths around, uh, uh, it may increase my consumption and it may, you know, it may not give it accurate consumption and I may get um, uh, like, you know, they, they, they could be stealing at my house because they'll know what time I'm consuming and what time I'm not around. So there, there were a lot of things that needed to be, uh, the myths needed to be busted before uh, getting there uh, and um, uh, like, you know, bringing local communities together uh, for any kind of new technology intervention uh, is the key, uh, you know, with the examples that we have seen uh, with the different technology interventions that we have done. So that has really worked very well. And I think that's the way forward for any kind of uh, new technology uh, implementation. 
Thank you very much, Rina. And thank you all. I think it's really interesting when we talk about trust, how much similarity there is in very different parts of the world with very different approaches. First of all, trust is central, but also the, this interesting interplay of companies such as utilities, community organizations, bottom-up approaches, but also the role of policy, the role of, of, of technology, I think is really interesting. And I think there's some of the key takeaways from uh, today's webinar. So. As we run out of time, friends, I just really, again, want to thank all of our speakers. I think it's been really fascinating. I really uh, commend the work you're doing. I think it's really important, uh, really inspiring for us all to hear. And equally, I want to thank all of you who, who joined us today for this discussion. Uh, I think it's been really interesting. And again, to stress, this is part of an ongoing series of events and discussions we at the IEA are facilitating. Uh, very happy to hear from anybody joining us today. If you have experience to share or lessons you've learned, and do please follow our website for news of, of upcoming events in this series, which will be coming soon. And equally, some of the themes we've discussed today, we'll be discussing in just one month's time at the IEA's Global Energy Efficiency Conference taking place here in uh, France, in Paris, in early June. Uh, and we'll put a link to that event into the website if it's of interest to any of you. Uh, we'll put it into the chat just now so you can see and find out more details. But with that, I'd, let me just thank Eduardo, Charney, Adela, Valerio, and Rina. It's been great to have you all with us today. We, we really learned a lot from you. So I want to thank you all for your participation. Thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. For having us.